My name is Seb and welcome to The Prototype, a channel I explore how to take concepts through to working prototypes. In this episode, I'm going to hack and reverse engineer a remote control to hook up my ceiling fans to my home automation network. Let's get started. Thank you so much for watching, it means a lot to me. And if you're new to this channel, please consider subscribing. So I've got a home automation system, home assistant, running off a Raspberry Pi, and I'm pretty happy with it so far. One thing that's eluded me, however, is that my ceiling fans are not part of the network. My goal is to see if I can connect this ESP32 Wi-Fi processor to this remote control and have my fans controlled remotely. So I have a few assumptions to validate. Firstly, can I run this at a lower five or 3.3 volt level? Secondly, can I connect this remote to this uh, processor and have it controlled? And then finally, can I reverse engineer the circuit inside this and build my own custom version of it? To test the first assumption, I'm going to need to take this remote apart. Dave Jones will be proud I didn't turn it on first. Looks to be a fairly straightforward circuit. The main chip here is an HT12E, which is an encoder used as a modulator. I'll link the data sheet below. The round silver thing is a Sol resonator, which my guess is is what's providing the carrier frequency. Let's take a look at the underside. Fairly straightforward again, we have our six control buttons, only five are exposed in my remote. The address dip switches are drawn out, they're connected 88 through to 11, and that allows me to select which fan I want to control in my house. The diodes look like they're configured as an OR gate as they share a common node, and that's the RF transmitter circuitry at the top with the corresponding matching antenna. Okay, let's see if we can draw the circuit. Opening up my notepad, I start by tracing the buttons back to the encoder. We can see that each button shares a common ground and they pull each input low when pressed. They connect to the transmit enable via the diode, which acts as a common anode gate. Basically, pressing any of these inputs will also pull the transmit enable low. We have a clock frequency resistor of 820K and our modulation output heads over to the RF circuitry up here. I want to see what's going on under the hood and to see if I can run it off a lower voltage. I should be able to, the encoder has a wide operating range, but I might need to adjust the 820K resistor according to the data sheet. Connecting my oscilloscope to the data outline, I press a few buttons in turn and check that my fan stopped and started. We can definitely see the data coming through here, so this is certainly acting as a modulator for the 433 MHz carrier. Now, I could work out the binary of each of these signals and have my processor act as the modulator, especially since it's only operating about 1.25 kHz. But I like doing things in hardware rather than software. Looking at the data sheet, it looks like that there is no real difference between the address and data lines coming in, so these can all be treated equally as inputs or outputs from the processor. Okay, so my next assumption is that I can control the remote using the ESP microcontroller. To test that assumption, I connected wires to the power source of each of the inputs so that I can easily hook it up to my breadboard. I then plugged in the ESP32 dev board and done. <laughs> Pretty, isn't it? To test, I write a quick program which will pull the appropriate pin low for a quarter of a second. That should be enough to register an input. My code alternates between low and off every 20 seconds, flashing the onboard LED each time so I know it's working. Powering it up by five volts, I check and yep, my fan is definitely responding. Cool. Okay, now that's done, I'm gonna load up ESP Home. Because I already have Home Assistant set up, this should be a fairly straightforward exercise. I create a new definition for the fan controller and used a custom switch as my fan, as it has multiple states, low, medium, high. Once I compiled this using ESP Home tool, I flashed the device over USB. As soon as I did this, my Home Assistant detected the new fan and I was able to connect the fan to a button on my dashboard. It literally took me longer to work out how to get the icon to spin than it did to flash. ESP Home is pretty awesome. Okay, now to my favorite part, testing the assumption that I can reverse engineer this and design my own circuit. While I could stop here as it works, having a breadboard lying around in my home isn't really neat or robust. 
So I jump back onto my notepad and put together a block diagram. If you watched any of my other videos, you'll know that I love having all of my projects broken down this way so I can consider all the aspects of the design. Because I'm using ESP home environment, the ESP32 processor and Wi-Fi is a given. The effector in this case is the fan via the 433 MHz transmitter. I need an LED to communicate what's going on. A logical sensor would be temperature, and I could also put an optical encoder to sense the speed of the fan to provide some real-time feedback. But I'll decide against this because one device is going to troll multiple fans, and I don't really want to have these sensors in every single room of the house. Okay, on to the RF design. Looking closely at the circuit, we can see this design uses an RF trace antenna, which I'm guessing is a quarter wavelength of 433 MHz, around 17 centimeters. The core of this design is centered around the 433 MHz saw resonator. I look online and I find a slightly different model than the one on this board, which came with this great application note. In it, there's a reference to the RF circuit, which I intend to use. I'd rather use this new reference than try and reverse engineer the exact copy of the remote, as coupling circuits tend to have very small capacitances, which are problematic to measure accurately. And you kind of need to get them right, and as I don't have a network analyzer handy, I kind of need to go by something I know. I feel more comfortable taking the official reference like this one. I quickly sketch this out in my notepad and check all the component values before jumping into CAD. And voila, it took me about an hour to get everything down, which included putting together the custom footprint of the saw resonator. The blocks in this circuit largely follow my block diagram, using the convention sensors on the left and output effectors on the right. I'll include a link to this in the comments below. Okay, now I lay out the PCB, and I'm going to take a little bit more time to go through this with you based on comments from previous episodes. I like to have my data sheets and schematics open on one side of my monitor and the PCB board on the other. The first thing to do is to get the size of the board right. Next up, I lay out the critical components, those that must be positioned precisely. This could be external mounting ports, LEDs, displays, holes, or in my case, I want the two antennas to be as far away from each other as possible. The design for this PCB trace antenna came from the reference document, which I copied exactly, and you can see the suggested layout here. I'm going to try and follow this as much as possible. Next, I'm going to place the encoder between the RF circuitry and the ESP32, positioning the parts that make logical sense to be close, in this case the diodes. I generally try and place my components in blocks before laying down traces. However, in this case, I want to emphasize that these two parts go together, so I quickly connect the diodes and test points. Next up, the temperature sensor can go down here, the power stuff at the top, and that leaves the programmer and reset button. Sounds obvious, but the trick when laying out boards is to have a plan. Start by grouping components in functional blocks, and then arrange them so you minimize how many times the air wires end up crossing. Think about data lines and power return paths, and keep all things RF far, far away from everything else. Now that I'm done with the placement, I start by laying down traces. Because I copied the RF reference design, this part doesn't take too long at all for the transmitter. Next up, the encoder. Now, you can see here that I copied the pins that I used in the dev kit version, but if I followed this directly, I would have to cross lines under the board. Now, that's not critical, but for elegance, I can remap the pins so they follow the same order as the encoder. It really doesn't matter to the processor if pin 13 is off or medium. This is a cool trick to get your layouts really neat. Just be careful as not all pins are equal, especially on the ESP32. Now, because I haven't crossed, I can squeeze the diode return path through each pin and connect this to the other side. As I mentioned before, I could have measured the encoder output for each button press and had the ESP32 put this together. However, given this is a one-off, for the sake of a few dollars and extra hardware, it's not worth the time to go through the process of doing so. If this was a mass-produced item, however, I would have made a different engineering decision. So this is a little annoying, but the i squared c sides are on the other side to where they need to be. Now, I could go around, but I want to stay away from the RF section. Instead, I'll need to drop them to the other side of the board. The bottom side will be a giant ground plane, so I want to keep these short to minimize the return path obstructions of the ESP. Basically, I want a straight line between all the ESP ground and power pins back to the ground point. The small ground plane you can see here is for the power, is to give the LDO regulator a greater heat mass to dissipate heat. Next, it's time to put my ground signals in which is as simple as just dropping a via, a connector from one side of the board to the other, next to each pin. When I finish the ground pour, these should all be connected. Lastly, the markings. Now, I like having all the markings the same size, the same font. So I go around and resize everything and then position them as close as possible to each component, trying to reduce the number of rotations. 
I rename a few parts for convenience and mark important pins like the programmer and the power. Finally, I set my ground pores. Although not strictly necessary, I decide to separate the ground pores for the ESP32 Wi-Fi side and the 433 MHz side. Having this operation with a single connection will help reduce the electromagnetic interference between the two. I make sure to put my isolation capacitors as close as possible to the single connecting point as well. Lastly, some flare. Now, it looks much more professional, and if I'm going to the trouble of using ROHS, I might as well include it. Okay, so here's the final board. I've turned off the ground pores so we can see it a little easier. The ESP here on the left, with the diode OR gate and encoder chip in the middle, and the RF oscillator on the right. Power up the top with decoupling capacitors and the programmer dock, LED, push buttons, and the little temperature sensor. Ah, I love it. And because I can, here's the 3D render of what it looked like once made. The next step is to get these PCBs done. Now, as I'm only going to make one of these, I've decided to do it by hand using a reflow oven. I export the PCB Gerber files, upload them to a manufacturing house, and get a couple made with a solder stencil. All up, $5 for five boards and $15 for the stencil. Okay, so that's it for this episode, as I now have to wait for my PCBs to arrive. In the next episode, I'll actually make the boards, design and print a case, and then install and test it in my home. I hope you've enjoyed this, and if you have any questions or comments, or want to see more detail or less detail on something, please let me know. Thanks for watching.